All right, let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Randy Malden. I am the president of Jack Quinn Solutions. We are the founders of Supply Leaders Academy, CPSM Training, RFX Academy, and as you can tell from our websites and the offerings that we have, we really focus on those in the supply chain world. It's a special skill set. It's something that has not been capitalized in until recent years, I say five to 10 years, recent years. And as we can tell from this current situation, supply chain has been noted as a key vulnerability to a lot of businesses and organizations because they just didn't think something like this could happen, could happen. So we wanna give you, the coronavirus, as we are all familiar, is a global pandemic right now. It is affecting everyone. And here in the United States, we are on, and uh, in, in where I'm actually in Florida, we're on a 30-day shelter in place, don't move, which is affecting a lot of folks. There's those folks that are essential out there in the grocery stores and certain businesses that are considered essential. And so if you're in that world, either way, a lot of us have stopped. And things that were important yesterday aren't necessarily important today because now we're kind of in the mode of food, shelter, water, medical supplies, take care of our family. Once we get that settled, then we have the opportunity to go get other things. So if you don't have it now, it may or may not be available to you. And you as a procurement professional, you are trying to get that stuff for your organization. That's one of the things that we do. Here's a picture of the USNS Comfort or in uh, New York City. They arrived and they're there providing additional help, which is something that the military does on a regular basis. We are responsive and we have a process, which I'm gonna show you today, that we train to, that enables military organizations to rapidly respond to any situation. And we think about it, we plan for it, we use different tools to gather information and we build plans. And then once we have those plans built and we're, rehearse those plans, then we can implement them whenever we need to. It impacts our supply chain. How has this impacted your supply chain? Well, you can just look at the headlines. The coronavirus wreaking havoc on retail chains, on the China supply chain, on the food chain, pharmaceutical supply chain, impacting bigger than what was expected, and we need more resilient supply chains. You may be experiencing this right now, or you may have a supply chain that's very good, but what I can tell you is that the current situation is going to continue to grow. So I do start with a poll, and what has been your biggest supply chain challenge right now? Just go ahead and type in, you should see the poll in front of your screen right now. Go ahead and type in what has been your biggest supply chain challenge? And the reason I wanna get that out on the table is because what our challenges are is what we're focusing on right now. They tend to be our priorities. A lot of it you hear in the media are the face masks that people need and medical supplies, pharmaceuticals. These are the medical needs, but these other things that people need, you know, food, shelter, water, toilet paper, that's been a big one is, you know, going to the grocery store, you can't find toilet paper, you can't find uh, paper towels. These things that we used to take for granted, you know, they're, they're, they're no longer there. And what we thought was there is no longer there we're gonna to have to come up with other ways of finding things and that's where your skill set as a supply chain professional has really gone up in value how well you're able to solve problems in the supply chain your relationships with your vendors the contracts you have in place and the imp impact of the government and we're going to talk about that as well is that when the government needs something they can take it if they need it they'll implement different things okay so a lot of folks, we have answers here, and I'll share those with everyone. You know, mask, workforce, logistics, that's one of the key things we'll talk about in our next presentation is the weak link in your supply chain is logistics, moving stuff, uh, moving stuff, sea and air, increasing demand on what exactly do you need, things or people are moving things, people working with limited personnel, working in a different environment. And I've offered some different suggestions and different guides on how you can work in the virtual environment like we're working here today. Payment delay, how do you get to the bank? How do you have those systems in place? Those things, you, again, you took for granted when you pick up the phone and you can process a payment really quick, no longer there, no longer available. A lot of folks even experience their conference ability, stuff like we're talking about here, took it for granted because Skype, Zoom, different conferencing, did not expect such a large bandwidth 
you know, eating up that bandwidth all of a sudden because now everybody's trying to do conference calls. All right. So let's go ahead and just take another five seconds and then I will share with you the answers. It's really been very interesting how people have addressed different issues. All right. Good job. I really appreciate everyone participating in this. Let me go ahead and share with you the results. Take a look at those. And as you can see, all the way down, you know, all kinds of different things. You know, a lot of it PPE, moving different things, materials, availability, businesses, suppliers. Now all of a sudden people are have decided whether or not they're essential, whether or not their business needs to stay in business. Now the government has offered assistance to where they could keep employees. Maybe a supplier has decided, well, it's not worth it. Maybe I may not have a business after this. And, and so that's something where you're looking for different suppliers, things that we have to think about that we didn't think about before. All right. So let's go ahead and close that poll down because now I want to share with you why this is important. Bottom line is this not over. We've got a lot coming down the pike. The, you know, the, the reports are saying it's going to get worse in the next two weeks as far as, you know, impacting people, their families. And when it starts to get inside someone's mind, it affects their ability to work. So people that you believe are reliable today may experience some trauma, traumatic event. And all of a sudden they're not as reliable just because they're, they're dealing with something personal that was not expected. And, and maybe they may deal with multiple personal issues that are not expected. OK. So be aware of that and just be sensitive to that. It's not just you, but it's also your suppliers and what they're going through. You know, it's just, you know, you take care of your, your area and your people, but also your suppliers have people that they got to work with and what they need to do. So what we need to do is prepare. And we're going to do that by adapting and overcoming the situation using the military planning process. My partner, you know, Captain Howard Knapp, he and I are going to go through this on April 15th. We're going to go into more detail. I'm going to go through it in detail today, how you can use it responsibly, but then even further down the road, how do you use this? And if you have experience in the military and the deployment and the planning sector, you know what we're getting ready to talk about, but how do you adapt something that the military uses every day and then apply it to your business or to your organization? And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Because you may feel like this at the end of the day, all beat up, you're happy, you know you're helping people, you're a supporting function, taking care of people, you're valuable, and you know you're, you're, you're feeling the pain. You're getting beat up by your customers saying, I need my stuff now. They're not being patient. You can see this in the media where certain governors of certain states are saying, I need 20,000 ventilators right now. And then they get 4,000 and they put them in the warehouse. Because even though they need them, they want them, but they don't need them right this moment. I was talking with someone earlier this week where they're saying, we need face masks. Well, what kind of face mask do you need? When do you need it? Do you need it ready to go? Do you have time? So that's where our thinking process comes into play. And we start to think about things in a way that enables us to have better decisions. This is how we used to be. We used to be defending profits from the economy, from vendors, or from competition. And this is how we are right now, is we're defending our stuff. We're trying to get the resources we need to do our job. If we're a government or a nonprofit, then we're trying to help people. We're trying to provide services. If we're a for-profit company, we're trying to get stuff to provide to our customers because they also have customers. And it's going up and down the supply chain. So we're trying to do this. We're trying to defend our supplies and do what we can to be more successful. And you want a team looking like this at the end of the day. They're happy. They don't seem as beat up. And the only way you can do this is by overcoming using a planning process. Now, we're going to talk about the military planning process. But the value of having a process is it's something you can exercise again and again and get better and better. Think about tying your shoes. When we first learned to tie our shoes, it was very clumsy and it took us a while to tie those shoes. But today we tie our shoes and we don't even think about it. It's just something that happens and it's just something we don't even think about. But it's because we rehearsed it. We practiced it. We practiced that process of tying our shoes. And by going through this planning process and outlining your process and every organization on this training is different. Everyone has different needs. So with those different needs, they're going to have a different process. So you want to implement a process that's going to help you. This is the, the mind map. I'm going to share with you today. And if you'd like a copy of this mind map, what I'd like for you to do is go to this part on our website, get the guide. And when you get the guide, you're going to be offered a free trial of Oya, which is this mind mapping software that we use to create these mind maps. And as you can see, there's lots of colors, lots of words, and there's certain ways you want to mind map. And you can use this mind mapping tool on a daily basis for your own personal use. And it doesn't cost you a thing. So definitely go here get the guide and then opt in to get your free trial so that you can use this tool to do your daily planning, to 
get a copy of this mind map so you can look at this mind map to see how it can help your organization right now. This is my background. It's been over 20 years in the Marine Corps, two deployments as a special staff officer doing what I'm talking to you about right now. We practiced it. We rehearsed it. We used it in theater. It was something that we could use so that when we receive a notification from anywhere in the political establishment saying, hey, we need the military to go here, then we could do that. You got I my brother in the Marine Corps, met Colin Powell way back when, when I was in the Embassy Guard. And as you can see, my family, I met my wife at the University of Florida while I was still in the service. And we have three wonderful children, which is where you get Jack Quinn Solutions. Jack being the middle name of my youngest son. Quinn being the middle name of my oldest son. And my daughter is middle name Sophia. And so Solutions, JQS, Jack Quinn Solutions. That's where Jack, that comes from. So why do you want to understand the rapid response planning process? It's basically less time planning so you can get maximum time prepared. It's planning in the moment in that specific situation. The Marine Corps does this, the Army, Navy, they do it, the Air Force does it. It's a joint military planning process. We call it the Marine Corps planning process, but other services use it as well. And it's a process that we exercise. This is a Marine Air Ground Task Force. They're positioned all over the world and they're available to be used by the, the administration at any time to solve problems. It could be a non-combatant evacuation operation, meaning we go into a country that's considered hostile and we have to pull people out. And we have to pull them out in a way that is safe and doesn't cause more problems than what we're already dealing with. It could be humanitarian assistance where we're giving food, dealing with a flood or a tsunami, or even currently, as you saw with the HN, USNS Comfort in New York, as well as the US, USNS in Mercy in California, providing that humanitarian assistance to augment those medical facilities. And or, well, we may have to be the first in in a combat situation. You know, that's just one of those things that we don't, that really we don't, we do it once in a while. We've been, you know, in a conflict for over almost 20 years now. However, we do a lot of these other things when we have a MU and we can do that more often. So another question is, you know, and I want you to think is what type of situation can you anticipate experiencing in the next six months? All right. I'm going to pull up my, what type of situation? Where's my question? Well, there we go. No, no, no. Where it is? There we go. Start your poll. All right. Go ahead and please put in your situation. Put in your answer. What type of situation do you anticipate having to experience in the next six months? And now this is an important question, because by identifying what that might be, it forces us to think through the ability to support that thing. Going out and identifying vendors that can do it, finding alternate sources of supply or alternate solutions if that source of supply or that thing or stuff is no longer available, okay? So go ahead and type in what is it that you anticipate might need in the next six months? And we're gonna talk about you know this and why it's important to have that identified because this is what the service will do when they're preparing to go on deployment out there. They're gonna think about what possible situations could I be in and then what stuff am I going to need in order to handle that situation? Am I going to need additional supplies, additional MREs, additional humanitarian supply, or are we most likely going to go into a desert environment versus a mountainous environment, a water situation versus a dry situation, a urban situation in a city versus a rural situation in the middle of nowhere. So by identifying what you might need in the next six months, or even for now, it could be the next six days. Thinking about that so you can kind of say, okay, what do I need to do? And the reason we're talking through this today is so you can anticipate future needs. And you get through this process and say, what my need is today? Okay, how do I get there and, and identify what my future need is? And you start to establish your own process and start to write it down so you can actually do that. Okay, about another few seconds, get everyone, as you can see, flood, war, military service, limited suppliers. I think that's going to be a big one. Your suppliers that you think are in business today may not be in business tomorrow, may have other options, may go somewhere else. The financial status where people make payments, you're going to get suppliers, promise things to suppliers, and they're going to expect payment, but maybe the financial system's unable to pay them. Something may change there. 
fluctuations in demand. When this first thing started, there was a whole lot of empty shelves in the grocery store. Now the grocery stores are starting to fill up again and starting to fill that thing. They call that the bullwhip effect, things that we talk about when we do our CPSM certification training. All right, very good. Appreciate everyone participating in that. Take a look at these answers. You can see everyone's thinking different things on what their needs, and there's a wide variety of the certain things that they're going to need. And so what our job is today as a support team function, as a procurement function, is to think, how do I support that? We are looking forward. What do I need to do to enable my organization to be successful, to be successful? And that's what we want to do. We want to be successful because change is constant. We are experiencing constant change. In these next few slides, I want to talk about the military population, and it's going to illustrate why change is constant and how the military operates consistently, successfully, no matter what the situation is. As you can see here, these are the numbers of the military uh, population at any one time, uh, their live population. As you can see, area of the United States, 3.25 million people, 1.3 million people on active service, another 800,000 in the reserve status, total of 2 million, a little over 2 million people active, only 0.66% of the U.S. population is currently serving. And what this shows us is that only 1% of population serves, but it's usually in that age range of anywhere from 18 to 45 to 50. So there's constant turnover, constant turnover, constant people leaving, new people coming in, and there's constant change, and yet we're still successful. And the reason we're successful is because we have a training that we go through, that we put everyone through, we put people through the training, and by going through that training, they see the process, and by going through that process, they're able to execute when they need to instigate or in, invoke that process, whatever that process is. And how we're able to maintain success is by having consistent training and following consistent processes. Okay, instinct versus process. This is where you get your old folks who've been doing it a long time. They tend to take for granted what they know and they don't realize that we have a younger generation coming up that doesn't know what they know. So how do you teach the old guard stuff to the new guard that's coming in? And you do that through process. And by training people on a planning process, you're building your leadership pop pipeline. You're seeing who can manage, who can organize, who can plan, and who can lead people through this planning. You're passing your knowledge from those that have experience because they're involved in the planning process or they're sharing their information, giving people information. And then they're teaching that thought process that is applicable in any situation any specific situation that may be out there. We're preparing for the future, preparing for the future. And that's what we do in the military. We learn the process, we adapt that process to the current situation, no matter what it is. But through training, practice and rehearsal, we're able to apply that process to that specific situation. Ultimately, R2P2, rapid response planning process that we're gonna turn into the rapid supply chain planning process, less time to get maximum time, less time planning to get maximum time to prepare. What we're getting ready to talk about is what is the rapid response planning, planning process? How does it apply to business? And then what you're going to do at the end to engage in our next webinar, where we're going to talk about resilient supply chain management. How do I create a resilient supply chain? Why do we need R2P2? The military has a concept called the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. And in the military, our OODA loop, our decision cycle, needs to be faster than the opposition. And the opposition could be an enemy who's trying to hurt you or kill you, or it could be a situation that you're trying to respond to faster than that situation overtaking what's happening. And that's what we're talking about today. You need to refine, and you want to respond faster than your competition to beat them in this situation, or faster to the environment that's developing. So as the situation happens, if all of a sudden you found out last night that your state's been shut down, you can no longer travel to work, were you ready? How do you respond today and able to quickly get up and running from your home office? How do you able to do that? How quickly does your team actually respond? All right, let's take a look at this. Share with me what's going on with your team. Oh, I messed that one up. So if you don't mind, just type in the chat box. They don't let me do it again, do they? No. Sorry about that. But how fast does your team actually respond when the situation changes? Okay. So, you know, think about this. Go ahead and type in the chat box. Is it something you can do through in three days, three hours, three months? 
Because right now, your ability to, to, to respond, your ability to support your organization determines how successful your organization is during this time. The salespeople, the engineers, the, the, the professors, the, the CEOs, the CS, all these high level people that made the stuff right now, they can't do anything unless they have the resources to do those things. Salespeople can't sell unless they've got stuff to sell. So they're coming to you. How much stuff do we have? Executives can't make decisions until they know what resources they have to implement into a situation. So they're coming to you saying, what do we have? Executives can't be profitable unless they know that they have money or how much money they're going to spend with suppliers, what's going to be available to them. So they're coming to you. You all of a sudden are now the key to their success where before you were the thing that they thought about after giving you the issue or giving you the problem. So you want to think about that is how am I able to respond and how quickly am I able to respond? And that's what we want to do is how am I able to respond and quickly we're able to respond because with the rapid response planning process, everything we're getting ready to talk about is accomplished within six hours. Now that may seem like a long, long time, but when you consider the people that are responding, we go back to our slide, you know, we went back to our slide a little bit earlier. What is a MAGDAF? This is all this stuff, all these people, all these things are responding within six hours. Things start happening within six hours. So think about, you know, how fast does it take to respond to something? And the way we do that is we're anticipating the mission, what is going to happen. That's one of the reasons I asked you, what do you anticipate your issue is going to be in the next six months? You create responses, standardized responses. Do you have certain suppliers you can tap into? Have you talked to those suppliers? Are you planning to be in business? What is their availability? What are your standard responses? Rehearse those responses. What do I mean by that? Call your vendors. When are they available? What is their new process to receive orders from you? Your customers, how do they get stuff from you so you can talk to your vendors? And so think about that. So that's what we're talking about here. The R2P2 process for the military is they anticipate what the mission is going to be create standardized processes like this planning process, re rehearse those responses, and they're ready to go within six hours, six hours. Speed and success is based on mission planning and preparation going on at the same time. So as they're getting information, they're calling people saying, hey, we might have a non-combatant evacuation operation. Go ahead and get your team ready. They already know what they got to do. They know what equipment they need. They know what helicopters are going to go on. They know what boats are going to use. They know all those different things and all that's happening while the leaders are planning what exactly is the situation where exactly are we going what exactly is the environment we're going into and then when they finally get to execution they're going to have little tweaks not big things that they have to do not big things that they have to do and that's what makes r2p2 work so well everyone understands the planning process they've already rehearsed these detailed plans they have the information they need to implement the mission they're getting updated intelligence and they're refining the well-rehearsed rehearsed SOPs that they've used in the past so that they can be successful. This is what it looks like. Problem framing. Okay, let's back up. You have the problem framing, course of action development, course of action war game, comparison of the course of action, orders development, transition, execution, and then you refine and do it all again as things change. When you frame the problem, what exactly are you going to do? When and where is it going to be done? Most importantly, why? This starts to build in what we call commander's intent, which we'll talk about here in a few slides. Giving people the knowledge of what the end state is, and then they can take initiative based on what the search situation is to execute that without having to call higher all the time and say, hey, boss, I need a decision on what shoes we're going to wear today. Instead, they understand what the mission is, where they're going, and they already know what shoes they should be wearing for that particular mission. Okay. Course of action development is they're developing different courses of action. What are their options to actually execute this? So this is where the commander's getting feedback from different options that they have, different teams, different ways of doing things, and they're evaluating the pros and cons of those solutions. A lot of them have already been rehearsed. And based on the specific situation, they're determining which one is going to be the best solution for this particular issue based on the specific environment. In accordance with the commander's intent, backing up, in accordance with the commander's intent. In, in, in other words, what is the end state of what's going to happen? We have to do a non-combatant evacuation operation, which means we need to evacuate all non-combatants to a safe area 
in six hours. Well, how do we evacuate them? Do we use helicopters? Do we use boat? Do we use buses? How do we get them there? What's the best route? How do we get that? Knowing that we don't want anyone hurt, we're going to look at the safest route. We look at the hospital ships coming in. They're in state according to the media, was augment medical facilities so that the medical facilities can focus on those that have the coronavirus versus other things that may be happening. People still break arms and break legs and things happen because accidents happen. So the USNS, these Navy ships are in place to ensure that augmentation happens so those people can still get care while the hospitals just focus on those with the virus. So that's what they're doing. That was the commander's intent. So what did they have to do? The UN, USNS Mercy had to get the, the port dredged for a deeper ship. They had to arrive at a certain time. They had to move certain maintenance back. So they had to prioritize that maintenance. What do we need right now in order to do that? So all that was done based on the commander's intent. And what when you have commander's intent, it talks about what must be accomplished, not how it needs to be accomplished. Okay. So I have another poll for you. So hopefully I can do this right. If you think about what we talked about earlier, what is your your most important urgent situation right now. What exactly must be accomplished? Not how does it need to be accomplished, but can you define what needs to be accomplished in that situation? So go ahead and look at the poll, type in your answer. What must you accomplish? Specifically what, not how, but what must you do? Do I need to find a new vendor? Do I need to call a new vendor? Do I need to ensure those vendors meet our standards? If I need to find new vendors, do I have a database that I can tap into? Do I have a process that I can easily onboard them so they can quickly get implemented into our situation? Okay, so that's what we look at is how, what must be accomplished, okay? What exactly must be accomplished? And then you start to think about, then that's gonna give your team the freedom to get that thing accomplished no matter what tools that they have and what you're doing is you're enabling them to be successful. You're empowering them because you cannot be everywhere at one time. Your boss cannot be everywhere at one time. So by giving you the commander's intent, the end state of what needs to happen, you enable your team to execute without direct supervision. I'm not talking about no supervision, direct supervision. You tell them to go do something you know because you've practiced it you've planned it, you've rehearsed it, that they know what to do and they're going to execute. And because you've gone through those practices several times, you understand that they know what to do. You've seen it. They've actually done it for you in a practice situation and now they need to do it for real. So you want to find out what exactly it is you need to get done and tell your team, we need to, for example, shortlist vendors. Well, what does that mean? We have vendors that are currently we're using. They may be at the top of the short list, but we need alternates. Well, who do we tap into? What resources are out there? Do I need to call a chamber of commerce? Do I need to call one of the, the National Minority Minority Diversity Supply Council to see what minorities businesses might be available that I never thought about before? Maybe contact the Veterans Business Administration, Veterans Administration, but they have a business section. What veteran organizations are available? Smaller companies that may not be proven to be big companies, but they're still effective. How do you find those folks? What do you need to do that are local? And think about if you've been using a lot of national vendors, now those local vendors aren't such a bad deal because they don't have to drive so far. Where do you find local vendors? Your local chamber of commerce. Pick up the phone, call the chamber of commerce. Hey, what do you got? Who are your team? And it lets those businesses know that they need to ramp up to support you. They don't need to shut their doors. They need to open up for business and explain to you how to do business with them so that they can be successful. All right, just a few more seconds. Go ahead and do this, publish it out there. Great. You know, I really again, appreciate everyone participating in these surveys. It's helping us all be interactive with this. And I want you to think because at the end, we're going to have an exercise two weeks from now on the 15th. We're going to build a resilient supply chain. If you don't have that resilient supply chain built with all the factors that we're going to talk about, then this is all for nothing. You have to have that piece built so that you can execute RSCP2, rapid supply chain planning process within that resilient supply chain. OK, so just start thinking, think about what you got to do. Volume, focus on the home office, working with your smaller vendors, finding those expediting orders, getting things moving. OK, these are all different results that everyone's looking for. Look at your key suppliers. Make sure they don't go out of business. If this is their critical component, think about that. What are some critical operations that you must have in order to do your job? Not your job, but the jobs you're supporting to get done. 
Okay. You know, we were doing training all last year in different uh, CPSM certification training classes all over the country last year. And these were kind of kind of conversations we were just tapping into. In fact, I was in California with the University of California at Merced and University of California at Berkeley and different universities there. And we started talking about coronaviruses. And one of the questions was, what if this thing really does get bad? Are you guys prepared to be a site where people go? Because people want to go to a university for some reason when things get bad. Okay, they assume that those are the experts, and a lot of times they are, but are they ready for that? Now, once you've come up with different options, different actions, you're going to do a course of action wargaming. This is where you are trying what we call, what I call, put on my black hat and try and poke holes in the plan. How's it going to fail? How's it going to fail? What can I do in those points of failure to make sure that they don't fail? Do I need to call more people? Do I get more resources? Do I need to communicate? Do I need to make sure they understand what needs to happen? Because I'm going to rely on them to get that job done. We're going to wargame everything. What if it starts raining? What if we have a flood? What if we have an earthquake? What if a hurricane starts coming in? I know it's not the season for hurricane, but what the season is, all the snow is melting right now and roads are getting flooded. Areas are getting flooded. We're not seeing that on the news because coronavirus is there, but these are highways that people have to drive on to deliver supplies to you. So that's where your transportation system, logistics, someone mentioned logistics a little bit earlier. That's where the logistics system can be that weak link that you didn't think about because they can't drive on the roads. The railroads aren't available. The planes aren't flying. They don't have pilots to fly the planes. They don't have drivers to drive the trucks. The routes you thought they were going to use are shut down because that state said nobody in or out. Okay, so what are your alternatives and what things do you need to build in place that you're going to be more successful? We're coming in. Then we're going to compare and then make a decision, review the pros and cons, and then make a decision. Now, this is where we as procurement supply chain professionals need to realize one thing. We are a supporting function, not a supported function. That means we are there to support whatever they decide. We're there to give our boss options to make a decision, and then we support it. We're not there to tell the boss, no, that's not a good idea. We give them all the stuff. They're the boss for a reason. He or she might, you know, you know, whatever their experience is, there is a reason they were hired as the boss. And so that's, we're going to give them options so they can make a decision. And once that decision is made, we're going to focus and support it. We're a support team function. So once that decision is made, we're going to move forward and then we're going to develop orders. So we're going to tell people what to do using, we're going to call them on the phone, call them on the radio, write things down via email, make create graphics and just say, we want to do this like a mind map. Like, hey, here's what we need to do. Okay. And what this does, it gives them a general idea of what needs to get done, the things they need to know. And they say, go forth and do good things. And then they go forth and do good things because you've trained them to do these things and they're successful. So you're going to develop your orders. Okay. Empower the initiative and flexibility. And then you achieve speed. If you tell them and that they rely on you to learn how to do something, they will not make a decision without you. Think about situations you may be in right now. You've been sent home to work from home. Your boss is not down the hall any longer to go walk down there and ask her a question, right? She's now at home on the phone. She may be available, may not be available. The phones may be shut down. Who knows? Or she's just doing something else. She's got other phone calls right now. You're not her priority. How does she know you're going to make the right decision? Well, if she's giving you commander's guidance and she's giving you the information you need to make a decision, you now need to make a decision. For all you leaders out there, you have to develop a situation, an atmosphere that enables people to make decisions without fear of failure. They're going to make mistakes, especially if you're starting to let them go at the, this moment. They're going to make mistakes. You have to forgive those mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and then move on. Don't crush them. Do not crush them. Give them the success by teaching them what they need to know. Say, well, you didn't think about this. You didn't think about that. So in the next time this happens, you want to do these things. Write that down. So you take your notes. You take your notes. And so that way you learn from that situation. All right. Remember, why are we doing this? R2P2 is to do things faster than your competition, faster than what the environment's giving you. So you can take action faster and stay ahead of it. Okay. We kind of knew there are certain states were going to start shutting down. So what were you doing to put supplies in place so those you had what you needed, those essential supplies in place so they could be successful? So you have to think faster, think faster. Okay, there's going to be a new situation, a new opportunity coming up. And then we transition. This is when we give people the orders and they go for it. They start to look at what we have to do. They start to rehearse. They start to drill, make it second nature. So when they actually execute and you launch the boat, you launch the helos, they go do the things that they need to do. 
you know they're ready to go. You start to transition into that. So all that happens within six hours. Think about all that stuff, all that coordination. And, and you saw the MAGTA for the ships. Well, in addition to the ships, you've got a lot of other things going on. You've got countries you're going into. Those governments need to be coordinated with. You may need to coordinate now. You may need to coordinate with other states, other counties. You may need to co coordinate with other campuses or other businesses. How do I get to you? How do you get to me? What you may call a railroad company now and say, hey, how big are the railroads going to be open? The trucking company, are you available to drive trucks? What are you doing? How can we help you? All this done is to execute these different things. How can this be done in six hours? Training and preparation. When we go for deployment, six months of training. And before that, even training begins, we all have our specialty training that we know we're an expert in logistics, supply chain. And then we come into this situation and then we train for another six months. We go through, we learn the processes, we actually go out and actually execute it. And then we get down to what we call, you know, the, the final test and we actually go out on deployment and we do it and then we're actually gone. And then we do this, all this happens in six months. You're talking thousands of people, thousands of pieces of equipment, hundreds of ships, all this stuff happening all at one time, coordinating, and it can't happen like that. It takes practice so that when you get in the situation, you can execute in six months. We have templates, we have information, we have information sources. And that way, when we come into that situation, we just fill in those templates, standard operating procedures. How many of us actually have standard operating procedures? Okay. What is your highest priority right now? I don't have six months to build all this stuff, Randy. What do I do right now? Well, let's start with what is your highest priority? What is your highest priority? Go ahead and type in there. What is your highest priority? We're kind of building up your thinking. What do we need to do? How do you need to do it? Okay. What is your highest priority based on that situation we started with today? You know, I need vendors. I need uh, higher vendors available to me. What is my highest priority right now so that we can be successful? Go ahead and take a look at the poll. Type in your answer. What is your highest priority? so that you can be successful, whatever that might be, all right? And by identifying your highest priority, you're gonna be able to focus your efforts where they need to be focused in order to fill that highest priority requirement. Because when we look at the different situations, we're gonna look at the priorities. And as we see the priorities, those things are gonna push other things out of the way. Because if everything's important, then nothing's important. So by identifying what your priority is, or more importantly, as procurement folks, our priority of our boss, what her priority is, then we're able to find those resources and then make decisions. Everybody wants face masks is a great example. Everyone needs face masks, everybody wants face masks, but who gets the priority for which face masks? The medical personnel dealing with those who have the virus, they have highest priority. So if I have 100 masks and I have a need for the medical people need 100 masks, then everyone else, you need to just go get into a safe space so you don't need a mask, they're getting the 100 masks. That's an example of making a priority decision based on the needs of the specific situation. So identifying what your priorities are is very, very important. OK, a few more seconds. I share with you the answer so that you can take a look at it. OK, you know, and, and again, high priorities, knowing what's available to you. And then by knowing that priority, you can then focus your attention. If you look at everything, oh, my gosh, everything's important. But you're not going to get anything done. You're going to spin around in circles. And we don't want you to spin around circles. We want you to take action, take action. All right. So as you can see here, people are looking, their priorities are different. Different see, people have different priorities based on wherever they are and whatever situation they're involved in. They're learning things, backup vendors, backup logistics plans, the grocery stores, grocery stores, if that's one of your local suppliers, or maybe you haven't thought it, maybe your national supplier is diverting everything to New York or to Los Angeles, and now you're stuck with no suppliers. Where are your local suppliers? Go out and find those. The same, when I say competition, everyone else is competing for those same resources. Everyone else is competing for those same resources. So you have to be faster, recognize what your need is before they do, and go get your stuff. Go get your stuff. All right. That's why it's important to have this process in place so that you can be successful. Now, how do you apply this to business? So I've shared with you the process. What I'm going to share with you or translate for you is military jargon, for business jargon, okay? When we say a military thing, what does that mean in business? And do I have that already or do I need to go build something, all right? And this is our mind map process. Again, if you want this mind map, go to make sure you go to this page, the page I mentioned earlier, put in for that guide, get your OYA account, then send me your email 
that you use to set up that account. And then I'm going to invite you to this mind map so that you can have it and you can actually make comments on it and we can actually flush it out a little bit together as a community and those involved in procurement right now. So it's going to be, you know, so even after the training, you get into the OYA, Voya account, then you're going to have access to more people that can help you. Okay. So get into that. All right. First, you should have a strategic plan. Now, if you don't have a strategic plan for supply chain management, is it too late? No, not really. Now you got to do that work now. And what you're going to do three months from now or four months from now, you have to do right now. And the key points of the strategic plan are the vision and the mission. What is the vision of our organization, the big organization? How do we support it? And what is our mission that we must support? Those two things are key. Three to five years or three to five months or three to five days. Those two other things, vision and mission, are key for you to develop any other plan. Okay. What's the process? You got to have intelligence. You have to have information to make decision, accurate information. What do I mean by this? This is where your warehouse inventory is now important. Something you didn't think about before, you didn't consider important before. Now, all of a sudden, how much stuff you have on the shelves is very, very important. So if you weren't involved in the inventory before, now you're saying, oh, now I regret it. I should have been at the inventory. I should have validated those results somehow because as the procurement person, I have to make sure those shelves are filled with whatever it is that should be there. And if the warehouse people, not that they're bad people, they just get busy and do other things. If they haven't been putting the data in properly, if they haven't been receiving stuff properly, them and doing things properly, then all of a sudden you may not have stuff or you may have a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need. Now, what happened to the military way back in Operation Iraqi Freedom, which I'm going to share with you a free copy at the end of this presentation. That was one of the key things is military was ordering all this stuff. You had people on the ground at the foxhole level said, where's my stuff? They would go to the system and they place an order. The system had to connect to the big system to send data. Well, Sometimes it connected. It didn't connect for because they're in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes they didn't have those connections. They weren't a priority on the communications channel because other things were going on. So then all of a sudden it hit, but they had placed three or four orders because they didn't have staff uh, status. So they placed three or four orders for the same thing because they didn't have status. They didn't think it got through. And then all of a sudden all three, four orders went through all the way through. And now on the other side, they get three or four orders. They say, well, they need four times what they really need. So let's get it to them now because they're in a wartime situation. They must have it right now. But in reality, they only needed one requirement. They got they ordered it four times. They got four times more stuff. The result of that was what we call the Iron Mountain. The military had all this stuff that was wasted, sitting in Connex boxes, not doing anybody any good, wasting money. More importantly, not doing anybody any good. Just sitting in a box and somebody else needed it. And now, you know, so that's something you need to think about. What is the data? Where's my information? What do I have? What do I need? Who has it? How do I get it? and make sure that you're able to see it as it goes down the process. In the R2P2 process, we call it intelligence preparation of the battlefield. Here in business, we call it market intelligence. What's going on in the market? What's going on in the market of my company? What's going on in the market of my vendors? What's going on in the atmosphere of the government? Who are the competitors? Who are the new customers? Market intelligence. If you don't have a market intelligence capability, you need to develop one. What does that look like for you? It depends upon you. We can talk about it when you join our discussion on the mind map. You talk about market intelligence. What does it mean for you? Then you're going to frame the problem. What that means is what exactly is the requirement? Face masks, ventilators, food, water. You know, going back to food, spoilage. Buy all this fresh grocery stuff, but you can't store it. So instead, rice is gone out the window, right? Everyone's buying rice because it can last a little bit longer. So what exactly is your requirement? That's when we understand what the problem is. Once we understand what the requirement is, then we can go in and develop options. Now, we talk about requirement, SOP, standard operating procedures. In other words, you can anticipate probably 90% of your customer's requirements and develop some type of standard operating procedure to fill those requirements, okay? Question, do you have SOPs? Take a look, answer yes or no. It's a very simple question. Do you have standard operating procedures that you follow? And I'm gonna have some more follow-on questions here in a second. So definitely, you know, if you yes or you're not sure, no. When what would be a no situation? No situation was that every time something happens, you have to reinvent the wheel. All right. You're always reinventing the wheel, always doing it from scratch. That means there are no SOPs versus when some problem comes up or situation comes up, bam, it's right there. You're able to have it. All right. Very good. It looks like we got some pretty good. 92% definite. Others not so sure. That's okay, but I don't see any no's. 
the next question. Take a look at these results. Let me share with you the next question. All right. Do the right people know the SOPs? In other words, are those key personnel? You may have these SOPs written, written down, but you may have key people in those SOPs who have no clue that they have to make a decision, who have no clue they have to provide you stuff, right? Do those key people know they have a role in those SOPs? When I went to train for people up in Alaska, they, every year, the entire state does an oil spill reaction. And every year, the entire state validates those vendors are still available. They're still capable of doing things. They can still get to places they need to get to. They have the means to get there. They always validate those SOPs. And this is where they find out a vendor may no longer be in business. They may have just gone out of business or gone back to Florida because they like the warmer weather. I don't know what it is. Okay. But do the right people know what they have? A little bit different numbers. A lot of people had SOPs, but not so sure if the right people know what's in those SOPs. And the next question is, have you practiced those SOPs? Why is this important? Again, this is where you exercise the SOPs and validate that they're still valid and they're still important. Otherwise, you have an SOP, it's written, it's sitting on a shelf somewhere and you're able to do that. And then all of a sudden you have to execute, but you haven't practiced it in five years. So those vendors that you were gonna use are gone. Those processes are there. That key person you think is important and thinks they know need to be there has retired. They're no longer available. That knowledge that they had up here is no longer inherent in your organization. So if you're not practicing this stuff, you can't identify those weaknesses when you're going through the process. So that's one of the reasons you need to have SOPs. Make sure the right people are involved in those SOPs, that they know they're supposed to be involved, and that you practice them consistently. Does that mean every year, every month? Well, it depends upon the SOP. That's how often you need to practice it, but you must practice. And as a procurement person, supply chain professional, you should be involved in most every SOP practice and rehearsal. Okay. If you're not involved in that practice or rehearsal, that means that they don't know if they can get the stuff. They're making decisions without knowing the ability to resource those decisions. Okay. A little bit different. Very clear, clear here. No's versus yes. And we had no not sure's. All right. So practicing those SOPs is very, very important. All right. Very important. The reason it's, it's important is because you're able to quickly identify what courses of action you need and understand your options. If you practice your SOPs, it gives you a framework to work within. You have to follow that SOP exactly. Not necessarily, but you now have a framework to make decisions because you've anticipated certain issues. So it should be able to do things faster versus having to create them from scratch. OK, so we have options that are available based on our SOPs that we've developed. Then we're going to go war game. We're going to compare different options. We're going to do our options analysis. So we can compare different options to see which ones are best, which ones are not so good. Using the face mask example. Hey, place an order with a large company right now that's kind of in hot water because of what they were doing and find out the status. Well, as soon as you place the order, you get it. Then you're able to say, my stuff is on order. What's the next question? When am I going to get it? Am I going to get the stuff I need or am I going to get something else? OK, so we're going to look at those different options because we need to know exactly what's available. Options analysis, courses of actions, SOPs, rehearsals, different course of actions. And this again, put on the black hat. What could possibly go wrong and what can I do to stop it from going wrong? What options analysis? And based on that, we're going to make a decision. We're going to compare our options, compare courses of actions and then make a specific decision. And once we make that decision, we support. We support to get it done. Whatever we said we could do, we do. And this is one of those situations where it's best to underpromise. If you're not sure you can do it, do not say you can. Because someone's going to make a decision based on something you said, and every word coming out of your mouth is actually a promise. And if you can't do it or you're not sure you can do it, do not commit to it because it's better that they make a decision based on what they know that can happen versus a hope of something happening using the face mask example, using ventilators as an example. Hey, I need 4,000 ventilators. Great. You have them. Well, I don't right, need them right now. I just might need them in the future. Well, you know what? So-and-so needs them right now. I could have took those 4,000 ventilators and gave them to somebody else versus you who's putting them in a warehouse and doesn't need them right now. Okay. So that's a difference. Why are we going to make decisions? We're going to look at different things. Okay. Then we go into operational planning, developing our orders, 
This is when we actually develop and create our contracts, our purchase orders, and our RFPs. If you've done the planning and you've gone through the process, a lot of this stuff should already be in place with your vendors. Speed equals success, R2P2, fast. You have templates ready to go. Contracts are pre-negotiated. You may have an IDIQ, a master contract, a master lease already negotiated, so you know how much it's going to cost. You just have to execute it. And you do, is there a clause in that contract that gives you priority over everyone else at that company? Something to think about now because it's an issue versus waiting in line. You negotiated, you paid a higher price to be at the front of the line. And most important is the last bullet there, your relationships with the vendors. If you've treated your vendors fairly and you've done right by them, most likely they're going to do right by you. If you treated them like crap, you didn't pay them on time, and now they're in a situation, and they have to decide whether I give you stuff or I give somebody else stuff, then they're going to pick somebody else, and that's not a situation you want to be in. So this is where your relationships come into play, and you want to have good relationships that you should have been building for years and years and years, and you can tap into those right now. Okay, and then we transition, and we actually issue the vendors, contracts, purchase orders, and RFPs. And this is where we want to make sure we have a process defined and exercised. Okay, so do you have a process, a defined process for urgent needs? In other words, if an order comes in that says, I need it yesterday, is the process already defined on who it's going to go to, how long it's going to take, who has decision authority on an urgent need? Maybe your spending decision authority goes up from 2,500 to 25,000. So you can make those decisions that you're desk versus having to bump it up to the boss or do a purchase or purchase purchase card order purchase card purchase versus an RFP because the urgent need is already there is your purchase card as a great example of things you need to coordinate do you have authority to spend 25,000 versus 2500 has it been approved and is the credit card company going to let you have it if all of a sudden the credit card company shut down credit your purchase card is no longer an option have you thought through that process? Do you have cash on hand somewhere or access to it to enable cash if your purchase card is no longer available for no fault of your own? No fault of your own. Say it gets lost. Whatever it is, do you have other options of purchasing? Okay. Do you have a cool process or a defined process? Okay. A little bit different. And so you're starting to see our numbers go down from, yes, I have SOPs to, well, can I really use those SOPs? And it's different. Definitely changing. Definitely changing. Very good. I really again, appreciate everyone participating. And then have you practiced these processes? Have you practiced your processes with your customers and with your vendors? Do your customers know who to call and how to call, how to contact you? Is it via email? Is it via the system? Is it, can they go direct to the vendors? If they go direct to the vendors and they go around you, what's the impact to the organization? You're placing orders for 100 people. This one person, number 99 or number 100, goes around you and goes right to the vendor and they order stuff and they take that stuff out of your queue and your availability. Now what do you do? So everyone needs to understand the urgent need, understand the priorities, and engage in the process and follow the process. Because the process is not going to work if people aren't following it. So that's one of the reasons that we need to do that. Have you practiced your process with your customers and with your vendors? Because if you haven't practiced it, they don't know how to do it. If they're going out on their own and they're spending their own money because they feel they have a higher priority than you are giving them, are they going to get reimbursed? Is that a process you're going to enable them to be reimbursed? Okay. Do they have that ability to be reimbursed? So that's something to think about as well. What are some alternatives to following your urgent need process? Okay. About half and half on this one. All right. Very good. All right. And then we go into execution. So up to this point, we've been planning, we've been practicing, we've been rehearsing, we've been validating our processes, validating decision makers, looking at vendors, making sure they can do it, finding alternate sources. And then we go into execution. So does your system, it's a very important process, does your system, let's see, here we go, support your process? In other words, can they go into your ERP system or MRP system or whatever system that they need to place their order and you're going to receive it? Is your system transparent enough to where everyone that's making a decision can get in and move things along? What do I mean by that? If someone is out of office at home and they can't be contacted because their phone's not working or the hour's out, is there an alternative that can go around that? Okay, so is your system enabling this to move forward? Again, have you practiced it? Have you validated that people that need to make decisions or can make decisions 
are in the system and approved. Well, what do I mean by this? For example, 25,000, you went from 2,500 to 25,000. It used to require a director's decision. You have that decision authority now, but now you need to go to 35,000. The director's not available. Is the vice president or higher enabled in that system to make a decision and approve and push a button? Because maybe the person that makes that decision regularly is not available. They're out, they're sick. They can't make that decision. Are other alternatives, alternate alternates available and in the system approved so that when you go to execute something, you don't have a system, what I call a system failure, a system failure. All right, very good. Yeah, definitely have a good group. Everyone's involved here. The reason I want to share this book with you at this point about the system is this is what happened to the Marine Corps during Operation Iraqi Freedom. It's what I did my doctorate dissertation on it. You'll have access at the end of this presentation. You'll have access to this material. And what happened was Marine Corps was in the middle of a system change and we had a major conflict kick off. What happened to enable the Marine Corps to be successful? What happened was people. The systems failed. The people did not. The people knew what to do and how to work around the system. And that's why it's so important that we're having this conversation as procurement professionals so that you understand that people are going to make the difference over your systems. You may be looking at your technology right now and saying, well, we've got the best system possible. We spent millions and millions of dollars on it. I can guarantee you that system will fail on you at the exact wrong moment. And are you able to work around it? Or do you have systems in place or people that basically hyperventilate when the systems fail? An example, Marine Corps is when they first went into Operation Iraqi Freedom the first time, when we were on the rifle range for the first time, whenever we went training, we would do a rapid fire. And rapid fire is when you shoot 10 rounds in less than one minute. Well, during the training, if you had a jam, you would raise your hand. And then someone would come and they would fix your rifle. Well, when we got into combat and we're sitting there shooting rifles down range and we're shooting, all of a sudden we had a jam, all of a sudden all these hands went up. And all the sergeants are going, what's going on? Shoot, fix your stuff, fix your stuff, because that's what they were trained to do. So here, the question or the point being is, are your people trained to do something different than what they were told to do in the system? Okay, were they trained to do something different? If you take a look at this book, there's definitely some lessons learned that you can implement. Things you're gonna do when you execute, your contracts are issued, you're gonna award those contracts, you're gonna administrate the contracts, you're gonna do your RFP evaluations. Are the people that need to make those decisions available in the system? Do they have access to the system? Purchase orders, are they accepted? Are people able to move forward? Is your system a purchase order system, an RFP system? What does it look like? How does it work? Is it something that enables virtual work, virtual evaluation to enable all that stuff to happen? So you wanna look at the purchase order system. Okay, and that's the rapid supply chain planning process translated from the military planning process to our process that we need and looking at these different things. OK, what do you need to do right now at the top of the hour? We're going to get ready to wrap up here so you can get back to work and enjoy your weekend at home, wherever you might be. OK, what we need you to do right now is register for the next webinar. OK, just go up into our links. All right. If you go into your handouts right there on the left hand, you'll hit on next webinar. Just click that link and register for that. My colleague, Captain Howard Knapp, is going to be helping me with this presentation. I'm actually, doing about 50 50 because he's in the current military planning process and he's building these resilient supply chains day in and day out okay if you want to take a look at howard's profile just go on linkedin look at howard knapp you can learn all about him as well as my experience of 20 years we're bringing it together to show you how to build a resilient supply chain and one of the key factors in the resilient supply chain is understanding the framework that you have to operate within OK, all the different things that can affect you to enable you to get things and stop you from doing things. That framework, knowing exactly what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. We're going to talk a lot about that particular part when we do this webinar. So we definitely want you involved. So do you do that right now before you do anything else? Take you ten, five seconds, register so that you are going to be in that webinar. All right. Next, we want to do is give you this, this access to this mind map. And the way to do that is to go to this website, opt in for the guide, which then the thank you page is the OYA registration pay page, which you can do for free. Okay, so just go in there, opt in, get a free account, and then I will invite you to get access to this mind map. And from there, we're going to have more discussion. 
What can we do in different branches? For example, market intelligence, what resources do you have available for you to find small business vendors in your local area? It would be a question we put up for the discussion inside the mind map. So it'll be, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. First time I've done this, so I'm looking forward to actually having people engaged on this platform, going through a mind map and see what else we can create. It's gonna be a good time. Gonna be, so definitely opt in for that. And then this is gonna get your free ebook, okay? At the end of this presentation, you're gonna be sent this free ebook, you're gonna have access to it, so definitely download it. And there's lessons learned. It's one of those dissertations, so you read the first summary, and if you're having trouble sleeping for any reasons, go ahead and read the rest of it. It'll put you out like a light, because it's one of those dissertations, but there's a lot of good information in there. There's a lot of good information about how people made it happen despite the system. When the system failed, the people made it happen. And that's the key, that's the difference. That's the big difference. OK, so as we're looking at these things, we want to make sure I'll, I'll click through these. But I'm going ahead and take a look at questions that we have. Take a look at things. OK, is there a slide? I only see the instructor. No, you should see a slide. We were presenting that. And for any reason, yeah, that was toward the begin, beginning. Not a problem. Everyone should be able to see slides. There's going to be a recording of this so you can watch it later. Replay. Also share it with your team. Share it with your colleagues. We don't want to keep this information behind the curtain. I want to get it out because right now the supply chain procurement professional is key to success in any organization right now. Your ability to give people what they need to be successful is essential. So they need you. They need your expertise to get this stuff done. All right. All right. Very good. I really appreciate everyone participating this afternoon. If you got everything you need, great. I appreciate it. Okay, go ahead and make sure that you opt in for the mind maps as well as the uh, all the other cool stuff I'm giving you. I want to make sure that we got that. Definitely the, the next webinar is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be interactive just like here. And what you should be able to pull away from this webinar, which will be on April 15th, be about an hour, maybe a little longer, because and we may have to do another webinar specifically on the framework itself because there's a lot to go through on that. What situations are you dealing with? Government's a big one. They can be your best friend or your worst enemy. If all of a sudden the government decides that you're no longer a priority, they're gonna shift all that stuff from New York to California. They've made that decision. Then all that stuff in New York is gonna to go to California. Government made that decision. Now you've got to deal with it. What are your alternatives? What else are you gonna do? Maybe you're in the middle, the, mid, the Midwest, and you aren't a priority at all. Now you can't get anything. You can't get the stuff you need to prevent the issue not more or less deal with it once it happens. So what are you going to do differently? How are you going to tap into those different things? Okay. So it's been definitely, it's going to be a good, good webinar. All right. Again, the mind map, make sure you tap into those. All right. Very good. So I have a couple questions. Let me go ahead and pull those up. All right. Yeah, definitely appreciate it. Irene. Yes, D. I really appreciate everyone joining us. Jeremy, Kim, Peep, Sama, Chad, a lot of names for folks. I can uh, Irene, you know, great. I really appreciate everyone being here. Howard, thank you. Everyone, I really enjoy it. You know, we're going to wrap it up now. If you don't have any questions, feel free to go ahead and drop off. The replay should be ready here in probably about an hour, maybe two. We'll send that out. And again, share this replay with your colleagues and with your friends. Get it out to folks, especially your team. Start to build these processes within your own organization so that you can rapidly respond as the situation starts to change. If you're not ready to respond, you're going to be stuck behind the eight ball. And if you have to try and be faster than the competition and the competition now is not someone trying to hurt you, maybe not even a competitor trying to outsell you. It could be simply competing for resources to survive. So you have to be faster and think faster than everyone else and be in a position of success when everyone else is trying to figure out what's going on. Ideally, we're all thinking this way and it's generating a need that's getting filled by someone else. And also don't forget some things that may be a want or a need could possibly just be a want. Focus on shelter, fire, water, food, and medical. Focus on those five things. Those will be Randy's priorities, just food for thought. And then everything else after that is second, third, fourth, fifth, not even important. We'll come back to that later. All right. Okay. Very good. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Take care and have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy. Be safe. Take care of your family. Please take care of your family. And if you need anything from me, any advice, any questions you have for me, send them via email and we will take care of it. It's whatever I can. I'll give whatever information I can to make sure that you are successful. If you need resources, let me know. If you're looking for a vendor, let me know. I've been retraining people for the last 10 years. 
thousands of people know who I am. Thousands of people know me and I can help. So if you have any questions or have any problems getting something, please let me know. I'll be happy to tap into my network to find those solutions for you. With that, have a wonderful weekend. Take care and we'll talk to you later.